Hello and welcome to the 10th video interview, which is a part of the ECMI Conversations with Experts. And each episode, we invite a prominent expert that works in the field of minorities to discuss a specific topic or recent, uh, uh, recent work they have done with one of the ECMI researchers. Uh, my name is Aziz Berdikulov. Uh, I'm a researcher at ECMI, and today I'm very, very delighted to welcome uh, a very good friend of mine and also a very prominent expert, Rashid Gabdulhakov. Uh, Dr. Rashid Gabdulhakov is an assistant professor at the Center for Media and Journalism Studies at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Dr. Gabdulhakov obtained his PhD from Erasmus uh, University, Rotterdam in the Netherlands, where he researched the phenomenon of digital vigilantism. Rashid, we, I'm very, very happy to welcome you here. Thanks for being with us. This is John, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and thanks to the ECMI for the invitation, of course. Always a pleasure to collaborate and um, engage pleasure. with you. Thank you. The pleasure is also ours. So today, Rashid and I will talk about Rashid's recent uh, publication in the making, where he's touching upon countering Russian dis disinformation in Europe with the case of Vodnikvastniki. So, Rashid, let's just cut to the chase. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this topic and why did you decide to cover this phenomenon of Russian disinformation and why specifically you chose to work with uh, Adne Klasniki as your case? It came uh, about actually several years ago during my time as a master's student in Geneva in, in Switzerland. And it was in 2015, 2016, where I first started noticing the... Um, influence operation activities on the platform um, among uh, Russian-speaking Germans, so the so-called Russian Germans. Uh, we can talk more about this group in detail uh, in a moment. But in that period of time, there was a lot of information shared around the so-called refugee crisis mm -hmm. and uh, the demonization of people coming to Europe, uh, demonization of Merkel and her politics, and arguably that led to quite a bit of the uh, support mass that eventually allowed the alternative for Germany uh, party to come to power. So already I had that interest in the platform, in the groups, that uh, in the thematic groups that are designed for Russian-speaking Germans and in the influence operations that take place on this platform. And of course, after February 24th, after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, I once again revisited the platform and the groups with an idea of understanding, okay, but how are the discourses constructed now surrounding uh, the war, surrounding Ukrainians, surrounding the politicians in Europe, and especially so amid the proactive uh, policies now in Europe to ban Russian propaganda and disinformation machine. So there was a ban on some of the broadcasters, but a platform like Adna Klasniki, which translates as classmates, can freely function across the EU, and therefore information that is being shared here can reach audiences here in Europe. Since you mentioned the Klasniki, and I'm not sure how many uh, listeners or viewers from Europe actually know about this platform. Can you describe what Adam Klasniki is as a social network and how different it is to proverbial Facebook or contacts or uh, to Twitter? Yeah, so Russia has its domestic prototypes of uh, the so-called global giants, of course. And you know, they are more or less connected to the same entity. And if you do a little bit of unpacking, you quickly see that the, the root, the origin... Uh, the roots lead to the Kremlin because you know the, it's either done through direct control or of course indirect ownership through state corporations and media conglomerates that are loyal to the states. In any case, Adna Klasniki is one of these platforms, just like Kontakti, you know, in contact that you mentioned, and um, it is also quite popular among specific segments of society. Each platform has its own affordances, of course. It has its own features, its own uh, participants, its own members. What's distinctive about Adna Klasniki is uh, the fact that it's quite popular among immigrant communities mm -hmm. be it, or migrants, be it labor migrants from Central Asia in Russia or be it uh, these diasporas of and, uh, and Russophone groups uh, in Europe or elsewhere in the world. It happens so because, you know, Initially, 
Facebook was designed as a university platform and that kind of got stuck in people's mentality. And then the interface is also, it's more in English, it's less convenient than the domestic Russian platforms such as Contact and Adnaklasniki, hence the popularity of them. Moreover, quite a bit uh, is allowed. So there is a bit of an anarchy going on on these platforms. So things that would be otherwise censored, monitored or edited on Twitter or, or Facebook for content, for copyright, for whatever reason, this type of content can freely flow mm. or, or, or flow around longer for longer periods of time on Vkontakte and Adnaklasniki. Hence, that's another reason to use that uh, those platforms. They're more convenient. Uh, interface is more convenient. More people are already there to begin with. So if you want to connect with people who joined the platform early on, six, seven, ten years ago, they are already there. And it just becomes this environment uh, for exchange of information and, of course, an ex exchange of news. Because what's interesting in the thematic groups, which you can form, I mean, there are groups as innocent as uh, cute cat photos, right? Or there are groups for, for different uh, communities, like Russians in Germany, Russophones in Berlin, or, you know, Russian-speaking Europe, right? And you join this community for practical reasons, because... You want to know maybe, okay, how do I buy a bus pass, right? How do I invite my mother to come visit me? Where do I find a Russian-speaking nanny? Anyways, you come with a multiple multitude of practical questions. However, what I observe is that these environments, they become places for an exchange of news, politicized news, and ultimately disinforming news. And... You know, you may have joined for practical reasons, but by virtue of being in the group, and groups are quite large, you're tens of thousands of members, you're also exposed to news that maybe you didn't seek when you joined the group, but you're exposed to it. And by virtue of being a member of the community, there is also a sense of normalization of certain perspectives, because you feel like you are collectively sharing this, this reality or an explanation. And, you know, running a bit more into more concrete details, but... One thing I want to mention is also the role of the group admins here, because admins become like these mini uh, queens and kings of these of these domains of these environments, because they get to decide who is admitted to the group and who is not. They get to block individual members and otherwise edit discussions. So it is in the hands of the admin. Uh, the, the the flow of information is in the hands of the admin. They get to to shape the narrative and the discourse a bit. Mm -hmm. So that's in a nutshell about the platform itself, the uh, thematic groups, and the nuances of information exchange of these thematic groups with the specific role of the admin. Right. Thanks. And uh, you mentioned that Adnoklasniki is especially popular among migrant communities or resettlers. And uh, we just tackle now the minority aspect of your research and can talk about Russian Germans or German Russians or German Russian speakers. Uh, Whoever, however we choose to call them. Can you just elaborate a, a bit on this group? Uh, what do you think is their profile? How did you define them for your research, for example? The name suggests that they come from Russia, but is that true? I think they're also Russian speakers coming from different post-Soviet countries mainly, uh, settling in Germany. So what is your take on this? So it's, it's a group of ethnic Germans who, who a couple centuries ago ended up in Russia. Some of them actually voluntarily to settle and to you know engage in the uh, agrarian sector and of course following the the world wars the suspicion towards towards the german ethnos towards the ethnic german people present in, in russia uh, has led to exiling them to the to central asia basically further away from the capitals so that they wouldn't become uh, spies or, you know, engage in treason and so on and be a bit further, but also to kind of use them as, as labor. So you send them to Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, and, you know, on the one hand, they're away from capitals, uh, imposing less threats to the center, uh, but also they engage in labor because they have to develop these uh, virgin lands at that, at that point, right? So re 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 rebuild the agrarian sector. And that's how they ended up in, in Central Asia. And we're talking about several generations, right? So there are ethnic Germans who were born in Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan 
before they were invited back to Germany amid the uh, collapse of the Soviet Empire and the subsequent invitation of ethnic Germans to return to their historical motherland. What's <laughs> curious, though, is that they maintained their mental link to Russia. I've, got, I've, I've interviewed some of the members of the community, and even those who were born in Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan in the second or even third generation call themselves Rusaki or Russians, which is quite So the, the identity with, with Russia and the identity with the Russian language being a Russophone, being linked culturally and subsequently politically to Russia is important uh, to, to some of the members of the community, especially those who relocated in the mid to late 90s or early 2000s, because mentally they're, they're stuck in that transition. And um, also some of them got a bit of a exposure to, to roughly speaking, this, the chaos of the 90s. And then this idea that, you know, a persona like Vladimir Putin is the guarantor of stability and economic prosperity, prosperity is also a bit fixated in their minds. But I, as far as I understand, uh, you know, the integration procedure, integration into the, uh, in, in Germany has been a bit challenged as well, a, a bit challenging. That's why there are these, these cultural and linguistic enclaves if we can use this term, where people socialize among other Rusaki, among other Russian Germans, and be it online or offline, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that has to do with helping each other out. You know, you come to a new place, it is your historical motherland, but it's still a foreign country where initially you don't know the language or you have a hard time finding a job. And of course, you rely on the community members, on the diaspora within the, the historical motherland mm -hmm. to assimilate to find a job and so on and of course we need to be mindful of the generational aspects here yeah because those who were already born in germany and then had kids in germany their children are, of course they have nothing no mental memory of the soviet union or of the 90s or of vladimir putin for that matter uh but if we talk about that that generation that that experienced the move they are, of course, mentally still stuck in the in the Soviet Union in the nineties and in the in Russian post-Soviet politics. Right, I think also maybe it shows in the generational uh, uh, audience maybe the views on the Klasniki more. Just the general assumption is that more people of certain age use on the Klasniki rather than Twitter or Fantastia. Okay, but it's since an excellent point as well, and I and I would have to agree here exactly. So it's the same people that use the classic. It's the same people who experience this move, who uh, also share the cultural products, right? Those those films, those movies, those uh, historical events. So they had they had a shared experience and perhaps even a shared perception of of reality. Mm -hmm. And that that sharing, that exchange, that that invisible glue that's the, of the social fabric, uh, they share both offline and now, of course, with platforms that like Adna Klasniki in the virtual domain. All right, thanks. Now let's go to the findings of your um, research. Now we set the premise. We talk about the Russian Germans or German Russians who use Adna Klasniki for these thematic uh, social uh, network groups. So you have come across one of those, if I'm correct, and you looked at how a group like this can produce a certain narrative about the war in Ukraine or about the events, about the refugees, about Ukrainian refugees coming to Europe, for example, to Germany. So can you tell us about the findings uh, you talk about in your uh, research? Of course. And first, a quick remark on the ethical part of this, because you have to be mindful of ethics in this type of research, of course. Uh, you know, you have to come in with a do no harm mentality. And I worked only with open groups. In other words, groups that don't require admin approval to join. Mm -hmm. so, anything that is in closed group, uh, I, I couldn't study for, for ethical reasons. Moreover, the data that I collected and, and analyzed, I only use in broadest terms. There is never a direct quote of somebody. So there is no uh, tracing back. Uh, and I avoid naming the group or offering descriptions that could lead to somebody finding the group because we're dealing with a very sensitive topic. It's, it's disinformation. And, you know, some countries have um, 
a criminal or administrative uh, protocol for these types of activities and you can endanger a, a person by by studying them because essentially they don't know that you are studying them when they're making a post uh, most people don't plan to be to be subjects in the research although of course they have to to understand that uh, by by posting anything in these publics they are making it public and therefore it can be seen by anyone including police including researchers uh, and, and, and anyone else so working only with open groups and using the data in the broadest term to describe what kind of discourses are going on again methodologically i'm relying on the on netnography uh, developed by Robert Kozinets back in the 90s. Netnography as a methodological approach has evolved nowadays, and it incorporates 25 or more different research methods, different tools. What I rely on is an is observation. So I, per, I'm a, I participate by observing, but I don't write anything. I don't engage in, in back and forth, in comments and discussions. I just see how often someone is posting, what is the role of an admin. And I, I also perform... Uh, qualitative content analysis, so I uh, discourse analysis, thematic analysis, different types of analysis depending on need um, of what is being said in these groups. Well, in relation to uh, particular, of course, clusters, thematic clusters. But I begin, it's an inductive approach. You basically allow the data to inform you. You try to come in, even though it's virtually impossible, but you try to come in with a, with an empty page, with a blank page, and allow the data to inform you. So you start seeing what is being discussed there. And so what I observed was an increase, of course, uh, in, uh, in posts on one of the groups that I, that I studied for this particular policy brief, and a dramatic increase in, in Ukraine being covered in the posts that are shared. Then I started looking into, okay, how often and who is posting? What I observed was that one or two active members of the group seem to be posting the most. So they're kind of the influencers. They're the most active group members. And the admin allows them to post uh, content and share. Then I also pay attention to how many people react, right? So I for me, all of these are artifacts, the likes, the shares, the comments, how are people perceiving, how are community members reacting to the comments. And, you know, then you try to derive some, some themes from what you see as well. In any case, from my engagement with this group and with the posts that were made from, uh, you know, February uh, 24, I see three broad themes of what is being shared every day, several mm -hmm. times a day. First one is the discreditation of Ukrainian refugees. So refugees from Ukraine who come to Europe, they are demonized. So some of the narratives appear to be like testimonies. Hi, like I, you know, I'm, I allowed refugees to enter my apartment, for instance, and then they polluted it and destroyed it. Or I was walking on the street and talking Russian and Ukrainian refugees were so aggressive because of that and they beat me up. So trying to portray Ukrainian, ref Ukrainian refugees as aggressive, as dangerous for Europe. And here again, I can go back to the beginning of my uh, talk with you, Aziz, where I mentioned the 2015-2016 European refugee crisis, the inflow of people from uh, the Middle East and North Africa. Mm -hmm. And it's a very similar pattern of demonizing the newcomers demonizing refugees demonizing people who need shelter because there is war in their homeland mm -hmm. also within this demonization there is the narrative of danger and there is also the economic narrative that it's costly that it costs a lot of money to taxpayers each refugee receives thousands of euros for rent alone and which is ultimately not true the second thematic cluster is the demonization of uh, Ukrainian leadership, targeting Volodymyr Zelensky specifically, but also the government of Ukraine and, and Ukraine itself more generally. So if we zoom in on Zelensky, portraying him as a Nazi, you know, can you imagine as, uh, photoshopping SS uniform on him uh, and linking his persona to Nazism, thus contributing to the greater narrative that's coming from the Kremlin that Ukraine needs to be denazified. Uh, the second uh, trigger point 
related to the persona of Volodymyr Zelensky is homosexuality. So portraying him as a as a homosexual and trying to uh, thus make him of a lesser man in the eyes of the community members and mm. again photoshopping rainbows and so on and so forth. Uh, the third one is stressing the fact that he has the comedian background, that he is a jokester rather than a politician. We cannot take him seriously. Having attacked the persona of Vladimir, Z- Vladimir Zelensky, they also attack the uh, notion of Ukrainian independence, right? That is the country, again, going in line with the rhetoric coming from the Kremlin, that it's, it's a fake country, that it was given to them by Lenin, that it's artificially established. And moreover, it's a puppet government and puppet country in the hands of the European leaders. And finally, the third dominant, dominating narrative is the fact that uh, Europe is incompetent, European leaders are incompetent, NATO is, is evil, plotting towards the destruction of Russia. And, and again, these are people who are sitting in Europe and, and you know, they hold German passports, they're ethnic German German citizens engaging in narratives that discredit the very the very fabric of uh, of the european union the european project saying that you know it's, it's long outlived we don't need it and really there the discourses they match those of the kremlin in the sense that nato is evil nato is hungry for russian territories and it needs to be uh, contained and stopped and pushed back even but it also feeds into the domestic populist rightist nativist narrative here in Europe. Uh, is talking about the populist uh, parties within the EU and specifically within Germany, such as the alternative for Germany, of course. And that perfectly fits their narrative as well. You know, we cannot spend more money on the newcomers. We're pushing away the immigrants and uh, maybe we need to secede from the European Union and maybe we need a tougher grip uh, within the country with a focus on the true people which are of course ethnic germans in their perception you see so another interesting phenomenon where where a group of people that is itself uh that itself experienced a move essentially a mi- migration expressing the anti-migrant sentiment i see and uh, i think that creates a certain paradox but uh a group, as you mentioned, um, uh, Russian speakers or German Russians are a sort of an enclave, linguistic, maybe ideological, political inside the German society. How do you see their uh, agenda, uh, agenda or power to somehow influence the, the main, the general German perception of Ukrainians or how harmful can they be if they're sort of marginalizing the Glasniki or they still have some power and their, their ideologies, their perceptions can spill over? To the main discourse, uh, where do you see uh, them standing there, the Russian Germans? There are several domains. First one has to do with the voting power, because any of this type of socialization, any of this influence of perceptions of reality, politics, other people, conflicts, wars, etc., etc., it leads to the decisions you make on the election day. Therefore, it has a direct correlation with the, with the way people will vote in the domestic uh, elections in Germany, but also at the at, in the European politics when it comes to, when it comes to Europe wide elections, of course. And here, the fear is again to vote. That, that 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 people will vote for parties like Alternative for Deutschland, Alternative for Germany, and uh, that the far right, nativist, uh, rightist pol- politicians will come to power. So that is an instrument that can lead to policy consequences, political consequences, because of the way people will vote. Moreover. Uh, this was the case in 2015, 2016, when I interviewed some of the community members who were quite vocal uh, in the, you know, who were quite vocally against the inflow of refugees. When mm. I interviewed them and I asked them, "But did you actually meet any refugee personally?" No, they said no. They didn't have a personal experience, but they had an opinion, and that's exactly the danger here as well. That Maybe some of these people will never see a Ukrainian refugee, but they already have an opinion about them. And of course, that leads to inter-ethnic uh, uh, hatred in, it, it, without even an attempt to build to build glue or to say that, hey, we're all here uh, 
without those trigger points for for the sense of belonging or for the sense of offering a helping hand there is already the closed door and and even resentment mm -hmm. uh moreover you know not everyone coming from ukraine it, 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 it speaks ukrainian some of them are russophones and of course you might again like i said these are very practical communities correct so when you end up in Germany and some things might be unclear, maybe there are not enough volunteers meeting you at the station or helping you out, you might seek information online and you might stumble upon one of these groups. And the danger here is that you will not find any uh, help. We, on the contrary, you will find resentment and, and, and the pushback. And that, of course, is also something to keep in mind when people... Uh, develop or politicians or NGOs, volunteers and activists and media develop strategies to inform people that maybe some of these communities need to exist that are and I, I observe now that that it's happening here and there, especially on Facebook, but that communities that are open to Ukrainians need to also shape because so far the existing publics, there is a danger of, of this hostility. All right. So these are the general three clusters, and I'm sure there are more, but, you know, something that that, that I just uh, thought of uh, within this interview. Um, but how do you propose then to tackle this? I, from what you say, I can register that this kind of discourse, uh, the groups in the Kasniki can produce can be quite harmful on many levels. And uh, what do you think can be countermeasures on like German level or yeah European level to to I don't know to tackle this? Do you think that the Klasniki should be somehow less accessible on the European territory, or this uh, this uh, interferes into the freedom of speech, or freedom of access of information? Here it's a, it's an interesting game, right? Because if you forb if you block. Uh, then people will go to something that's that's in the shadows, maybe, and or, or you know, people will always find a platform on which they can communicate. Mm -hmm. So my understanding is, or my opinion, my personal opinion, my personal view on this is that media strategies need to be built on Adnaklasniki. So Adnaklasniki is prevalent; it's here, but more counter narratives need to be constructed on Adnaklasniki to reach these audiences because you already have a platform with the audiences. Because banning will always lead again to resentment. And people will say, you see, now they're even depriving us of the open forum. Now they're depriving us of this space where we can exchange information. So what we are saying is ultimately true. And now we are going to go to another platform, okay, Telegram or Signal or elsewhere, where we can maintain the community and keep exchanging this information, but now outside of anyone's view. So this information can, has to be countered with with quality information but on the same platform and it has to be battled but of course another problem with that Naklasnik is that a lot is possible there like i said it's very weakly edited mm -hmm. and some things that disappear on that Naklasnik eventually right some content that has been flagged reported or tracked um some of this content then reappears elsewhere and people already say okay we have a separate community on telegram because much more is possible there so All if right. you want to learn more, if you want to see more, if you want to know the truth, you follow this link and that's where it will be delivered to you. This has to be monitored as well. Uh, so I see that a lot needs to be invested into producing quality information, into counter narratives and into proactively sharing this, into relying on algorithms to deliver this to the people because algorithms mean a lot here as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they they you know, sometimes we, we live in a world where, where information just penetrates without us even noticing because of the algorithmic decision of what will be shown to us in our feed. Unfortunately, that decision is made based on our previous engagement with content. So if you engage with a, with a rightist, nativist content, which is anti-immigrant, anti-Ukraine, chances are algorithms will feed you exactly that. So we need to, we need to, and this has been talked about for, for years now, right? This uh, polarization, the filter bubbles, the echo chambers that we live in, and that needs to be countered. So the, the filter bubble is, is exactly this, uh, developed by Ellie Pariser back in 2011. The idea that algorithms decide what content is, is suitable for us based on previous engagement. And that leads to the fact that we are never challenged. Our views are not challenged. And we kind of keep boiling in the same uh, political 
ideology and views and with the same exposure to the same media. So that is something that also needs to be addressed. And of course, the way we deliver stories, right? So what happened in 2015, 2016, very few, very few instances, you can count them on, on your fingers, of, of giving voice actually to refugees. The story was always told on their behalf by somebody else, a journalist, an NGO, or, or not being told at all, right? Because you have a headline and an opinion. So given the floor to the people themselves to tell their story, to produce content, and of course that they're comfortable with, but to deliver the story firsthand, something that we missed in 2015, 2016, that's something that we're still lacking now and that needs to be facilitated that the story is being told and more opportunities for building those bridges, those points of interaction are established. Uh, and that way people can find common ground and, and learn more about each other and of each other's successes and success stories, because that ultimately influences opinions. If you constantly say that immigrants come and steal our jobs and uh, you know they're criminal eventually that that mantra talk that discourse that is shared across platforms and across uh, media products plus in the entertainment products right, because you turn on hollywood production and again who are the terrorists who are the criminals and so on you get the perception and idea of reality but when you have a, a, a separate a different narrative a different story of success, of benefit to the society, or of, of devastation that people went through, and that's why they need shelter, that's why they need refuge. That is a very, a very different storyline that also needs to be delivered. And then, of course, we, you know, some of the content just needs to be removed, because in my observations, on Adnaklasniki, in the thematic groups, some content is not only openly racist, it, like, it is like open calls for violence, right? And these, eventually these, these products get removed for whatever reason, but like I mentioned already, they're available elsewhere, uh, which, which means that a better job needs to be done in terms of um, removing harmful uh, content. And here, of course, is always a fine line between censorship All right. and uh, you know, and, and safety and security of of the, of the of the nation, region, or the world. And professionals have to address that, but also it has to be done uh, with a, with a discussion and consultation, so so that it doesn't become an excuse that hey, we remove this content because it's potentially dangerous, but then you are actually silencing the dissent or silencing some of the critical voices. That should also not uh, not be allowed, of course. So it's it's really tough, as is John. I can't have a clear recipe. Unfortunately, it's multifaceted. Yeah, different types of domains. But bottom line is between complete closure and a, a delivery of counter narratives. I would opt for. I I am keen to opting for developing counter narratives and delivering them to these audiences. But I think this kind of. Um measure should be a complex uh, one and uh, i just wonder and that will be my final question do you think more traditional media like tv radio stations and newspapers can also be involved uh, in germany for example to do so is it tangible i just wonder how much the russian speaking communities in germany are exposed to german uh, media so if this media also become part of creating this counter narrative that aims at uh, facilitating uh, communication between a German uh, government, Russian speakers, and Ukrainian refugees, and other minorities, other refugees, how successful this attempt can be, in your opinion? Of course, we, should, we need to avoid uh, viewing Western or German media as a homogenous entity, and that is a mistake that is being made too often. We don't have a homogenous uh, media, it's, it's, and moreover, uh, there is no such thing as like this this good good good, good uh, opinion right that is being right. delivered because uh, it, it, first of all there are business models and there are ideological differences and you also have this polarization in the traditional media where uh, which in fact penetrates some of these discussions as well so that's another important point that sometimes people rely on traditional media in online discussions uh, because they they it, it works as a layer of credibility that you add to your argument so you say something and you say but here is a link to the traditional media and that of this newspaper and somehow that is supposed to make your argument more valid but of course that traditional media can be it can be a tabloid it can be a um 
ideologically right paper. It can be a paper that is indeed, you know, delivering a narrative that is anti-immigrant or pro-Putin, pro-Kremlin and anti-Ukrainian. That is also possible and that can, you know, be delivered through traditional media that is freely published here because of the way things work, right? Because again, this, this discussion between uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press versus censorship, you know, political discussion and so on. So when we say something like, yes, traditional media should be involved, first things first, we have to understand that it's also, it has its own agenda, political agenda, business agenda, and, you know, everyone will be doing exactly what they want. Of course, there are also other things. So <laughs> when, when let's say, traditional media, even if there is some agreement among some <laughs> But uh, papers or broadcasters or news deliverers to to develop a narrative, let's say, that could target Russophone, Russian Germans uh, with a particular explanation. What can happen is, is again, this, this blockade. They say, okay, uh, that's propaganda on TV. Mm -hmm. and, and that fits the general disenchantment now that is, that is globally, um, which is the kind of a global phenomenon. And of course, Trump contributed to that as well, right? With the fake news. Fake news, fake news, fake news, fake news. So everything, anything you disagree with, suddenly you add a layer of conspiracy to this and you say that it's okay, the world is conspiring, you cannot trust the TV. So in fact, it will push you back to that online environment because you feel like there are the people you who understand you and who you understand and can relate to. That's the truly alternative narratives and mm -hmm. the truth is there. So the TV is lying. The online domain is saying the truth and therefore I will go back there. And it will push you further into the abyss of that echo chamber and of that um, socialization with the same people, with the same topics, with the same ideas and the lack of, uh, of challenge. That is not to say that these media campaigns shouldn't be delivered or shouldn't be attempted to be delivered. And that, of course, once again, I will stress the fact that the voice needs to be given to Ukrainian citizens, to Ukrainian refugees uh, as well. And that, you know, maybe specifically targeting Russophone Germans or people who speak Russian and live in Europe is also important, but in such a way that doesn't, you know, that is, that doesn't demonize anyone that, that works, that doesn't do the counterproductive uh, impacts as well. It's really hard, as it's done, really hard to, to deliver such a message. It has to be multifaceted, like you said, so it has to be a multitude of products with multitude of platforms involved, right? So, it, because there is a different affordance, different mentality for each platform, things mm -hmm. that can be delivered quickly, in one minute or less, you know, 280 characters or less, uh, or shorter videos, shorter films versus uh some longer reads and exactly, yeah. and all of that needs to be kept in mind as well. And Thank the you. language, of course, it has to be delivered in different languages, so in German, but also in Russian and in Ukrainian. I think so, and I think that's important when you mention that lots of uh, Ukrainian refugees who come here, they also speak Russian, and there are so many other communities in Europe speaking Russian, and that also puts them in a... It's not deniable. Russian is a, is a lingua franca, and, you know, it's also, it is a colonial language, of course, and, you know, the very term that we used to describe it, lingua franca, it has colonial roots. In any case, Russian language does not belong to Russia or to Putin or to Kremlin, right? I'm an ethnic minority myself in, uh, in the country where I live, and we speak Russian. It belongs to us as much as it does to uh, you know, to Russia, to another country, or to Kyrgyzstan, or to Russophone communities in Europe, it is a language uh, that is an instrument. And of course, if we neglect and we say, okay, now everything will only be delivered in Ukrainian, then of course those audiences, those enclaves that I mentioned, they will be further left out. And therefore, this let's say alternative narratives, if, if there is a counter information uh, campaign needs to be delivered also in Russian and in German and in Ukrainian. All right. Thank you very much, Rashid. It's very interesting. I think we can go on, but unfortunately, we have a time limit. But uh, it was great having you. I'm sure our pleasure. Yes. John, thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you. are you. most you welcome. welcome. I uh, invite all of our viewers and listeners also to follow Dr. Rashid Yabdulhakov's work. Uh, and as well as check out what ECMI does on our socials, on our website, LinkedIn, Instagram. And until our next episode, we say goodbye. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.